So you're, you're pretty much right in the middle. I want you to uh, reflect for a moment. I want you to really think of them, all right? Think, I want you to think of somebody who influenced you. Probably, do you, can you picture somebody in your mind? Might be a parent. Might be a teacher. Might be your past. No. <laughs> it might be somebody else in your life. Think of somebody that influenced you. Got them. Lock them in. Now, I want you to just reflect for a moment. Where would you be now without their influence? Who would you be without their influence? It's wild, isn't it? Wild to think that one or two people can steer ships so well. I remember when I was in elementary school, I was not perhaps your brightest student. If I got a 61, per, we had percentages back then, as if in grade three you can tell the difference between 61 and 62%. Anyway, so I, 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 I would get a solid 61, 62. If I was dipping down in the 50s percent, that was bad. But if I was 65, I was like a great day. I was a solid bad student, all right? <laughs> solid consistently bad student. I only failed spelling three years in a row and probably had something to do with me throwing my speller away down a ravine. But anyway, that's a whole other story. I remember my grade seven teacher, Mr. Pearson. Mr. Pearson said we need to do a science project on bees. And so I, I don't know why I just got into the bee thing and my dad helped me research bees. I made little bees and I, I, I did this whole little, you know how you do bee things in grade seven. I, I did a bee thing. And I remember him coming to me and he said, Dave, that's the best science project I've ever seen. He awarded me the science project a, a, a prize in grade seven, which was a tree he was actually probably trying to get rid of. Anyway, that did something. Isn't that weird? One man's comment, one man believing in me, all of a sudden go, hold on. I am not stupid. I might have some brain cells. And from then on, I just excelled in my, my scholastic ability because of one person giving influence. Imagine, has anybody influenced you spiritually? Has anybody come beside you, answered some questions, given you some ideas spiritually? Have you gone to a church service somewhere around this world where you go, if I hadn't done that, where would I be now? Who? Would I be now? I know for myself, Harvey, Harvey, the amazing wonder Christian, my friend in, uh, in high school, I just uh, I got to see him last week just for uh, uh, a short bit. It was awesome. Uh, he came to Christ. He came to me, and he said, Dave, I want you to disciple me. I said, sure, we will read the Bible and pray. <laughs> had no idea. It would be reverse discipleship. And he helped me grow. And he would say, well, let's tell everybody about Jesus. And I said, no, I'm a good church kid. I don't do that. You know, that's like le lesson 53. Pastors do that. But no, he, he just took me around, and we talked to people about Jesus. He just he reminded me. I said, Harvey, what do you remember about those years? He said, Dave, I remember sitting at the lunch table and we just talk about what God's doing in our lives we talk this way but our conversations were pointed we're aiming that way but we're talking this way and all the people around would go wow that really happened yeah that. and then we we'd get into these conversations ah oh. every so often I think what would happen to me I would not be here if I hadn't run into Harvey huh. there's something about influencing a life forever it's not only the, the, the thought of helping somebody forever. It's just the amazing, cool feeling. I know this is like so feeling-oriented, but the wonderful feeling that God used me. That's, <laughs> it is amazing. I, you, you know what that's like, don't you? Every so often it's like, God, you go, God loves me. God chose me. God used me. 
I, I ran into somebody not too long ago, and they, they came up to me, and uh, I could just tell that they're so excited, almost in tears, and they had invited somebody out to church, and that person came. And this is what she said. She said, I can't believe God used me, a sinner. I said, welcome to the club. <laughs> welcome to the club. He uses messy people to get his job done. No perfect people here. But it was amazing. Beyond the feelings, beyond the thought of forever, the Bible actually com commands us to influence each other as the gathering happens at the local church. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, let's think of ways to motivate, let's think of ways to motivate, let's think of ways to motivate everyone. It doesn't say, let's listen to the pastor who will motivate me. <laughs> Come on to the church and let's just talk. Hey, you know what God's done? Oh, wow, I was reading this. I had this prayer request answered. Oh, all that stuff. Yeah. In that way, what we do we think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let's not neglect meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. Hey, you coming out to church this week? Oh, it's so good. I can hardly wait. And so I saw somebody coming in this morning. They said, this is my favorite building. <laughs> awesome. Kelvin Jim. <laughs> let's think of ways. Ah, let's not neglect our, our meeting together. Some people do. Let's encourage one, especially now the day of his return is drawing near. So we're doing this four-week series, How Can We Up Our Influence? And week one, we talked about how can we bless others by seeing them. Bless others by seeing their character now and before. We have a, a blessing chair back there, and last week it just got used the whole time. This is how you use it. If you want to bless somebody, you take them back there, you sit them down, and you pray over them and encourage them through that prayer. Mention things that you see in their character. Mention things that you could see, imagine, in their future, and give them a blessing. Uh, last week we talked about being seen. Not only how do we up our influence, we need to see and encourage others. Then, then they'll be open for the influence. And now we need to model a life in front of them. We need to be seen. It's summed up in what Paul says. Follow my example. He was actually telling people, you can follow me. Follow. That's, like, that's like gutsy, huh? Could you imagine going around, follow me. Wow, how can you say that, Paul? Because he says, as I follow Christ. Don't follow the other stuff. <laughs> follow me as I follow Christ. So we need to be seen. And we talked about this, to model your faith out loud. We need to model that faith out loud. Now, there's, there's places that people have asked me about, and it's good. It's a great question. What about people, well, places when Jesus says you need to go and pray privately, you need to fast privately, and you need to give privately, right? He talks about those things. You need to keep some of your faith private, and it is true. Let's read what that, one of those sections in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 to 6. It says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Who is he pointing out? He's pointing out hypocrites, hypocrites. For, for they love praying in the synagogues and the street corners. How do they love it? To be seen by others. I tell you the truth. Truly I tell you. They have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. So, Jesus is telling you to pray privately. But the interesting thing is he asked his disciples to come with him in the garden. Can you come and pray with me in a group? You see in the book of Acts, Pentecost, there's 150 people at the prayer meeting. And they're praying out loud together. And when Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 12, they had another huge praying with people were together praying out loud. And it was so miraculous, the place physically shook. So what do we do with this? Why did Jesus say, sometimes you just need to do this alone? And I believe it talks about motive. What is the motive? It, did you do this to be in order, to be praised by others? You've received your, your reward in full. If your motive is to go, oh, people will see how wonderful I am, <laughs> that I am so spiritual, then the motive is the thing that, <laughs> that negates any good that you're trying to do. To be seen is modeling for, for, is key for those under your care. But we need to watch our attitude. A good question we need to ask is, can you fast, can you give, can you pray without telling anybody about it? <laughs> is that possible too? There are times when only God needs to see, and then there's times when your care needs to be seen under pe or people under your care. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 
you know how we, you know how we lived among you for your sake. How, why, why, did, why did Paul live a certain way? It was for your sake. It wasn't his preaching. It was his living. He, he did this to model an example. And how do we know that? He says, because you became imitators of us and of the Lord. See, that's just an acting out of, I'm going to follow Jesus. You follow my example, so you're, you're going to be able to follow Jesus' example. It happens all the time. I remember when I was a youth pastor. It's an old story. <clears throat> Forgive me for those of, of you who have heard it. We, uh, <laughs> down in Iowa, they just don't have laws. It's awesome. When I was a youth pastor down there, I drove the, a bus picking children up with no special license and no insurance, Andrew. What is that about? Anyway, <laughs> so, so, and they gave me a 15-person van. This is before seatbelt laws. You know how do I know? They had no seatbelts in the whole thing. So we could pack 24 kids in there, which was amazing. And it uh, guided into community. So we would, we would go over these bumps. The kids would be flying all over each other. It was so unsafe. Anyway, every time I, I, I said goodbye to them, I let a bunch of kids out. They're a very uh, poor community. They could not get anywhere. There was no bus system. And so to, for them to make it to youth group, I had to pick them up. So every time I let them out, I said, okay, how can I pray for you? I put up a little prayer. And I let them out. How can I pray for you? Let them out. I came back about five or six later to, years later to do a, a wedding. I said, what do you guys remember about youth group? I was hoping it was something spiritual. And the first thing they said, do you remember that game we did with Alka-Seltzer tablets? It was amazing. <laughs> I gave those years of my life for that. <laughs> and finally, one of the guys says, oh, we're kidding you, Dave. You remember when you used to pray for us, when you dropped us off? And I go, yeah. He says, because you do that, you did that, for those two and a half, three years. I pray with my little daughter. I pray with her when I put her to bed at night. There is something about just living, not being preachy, not trying to convince, not trying to sell anybody anything, but just living, modeling your life out loud. So we're going to use, uh, look at our, uh, our next one, our next one <laughs> for uh, next one for the day. Uh, and this stems from uh, a story I'm not sure if I told you before. I was up at a cottage of a, a friend's cottage, and there were good parents. Have you ever been around parents that are really good? It's like I was around these parents. I go, oh, I should have done that. <laughs> That's why Cara is so messed up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, man, so uh, around the uh, dinner table, one of their little children was reaching for, you know, uh, I think it was ketchup for the hot dog. And this is what the kid said, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Ah, ever see, you know, ever hear that? Look at, the, ah, ah, ah. And the, and the mother just patiently just looks over with a big smile. Use your words, honey. Use your words. Ah, ah, I'm not going to give it to you unless you actually use your words. <laughs> I go, that's brilliant. And look, you can see the angst of the children going, ah, catch up, you know. <laughs> Say the words, catch up. <laughs> Finally, he relented and he said, catch up. Yeah, that's awesome, honey. You can do it. Use your words. <laughs> you know, I want us to be comfortable as Christians, to be able to use our words. I want us to see others. I want us to model to be seen, but I want us to actually be able to use words. You, like using the J word. <sighs> it's tough. The, 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 the Jesus word. Like actually to get it out there. Now, if you're in university, if you're in, in college, you might know that there's a whole movement out there where, where we just share love. We share the Father's love, but we don't share it in God's name. There's been a book that was written that just went wild. I got actually given two copies of it. I heard this guy at a conference, and here was his central thesis. He says, God is love, and so if I love, they're getting God. You don't need to tell them about Jesus. So I said, hold on. Inside I said, the only way for somebody to change is for them to have the Spirit of God in them. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And the only way for them to have the Spirit is for them to come to Christ. And you gotta kind of say Jesus' name for them to come to Christ. But I've heard this so much. That there is just, just love other people, but don't talk about Jesus. It's like we don't want to be pushy. We don't want to seem like we're selling soap all the time. Hey, you hear about Jesus? You know, washes your clothes really clean. You know, ugh. 
oh, make me vomit. No, I, I don't want to be like that, right? And so we, we hold back. We don't use the J word. Interesting. This is a little heavier subject, but I kept on saying, God, I know there's so many people on the way to God here. They don't need to hear this right now, but there's so many Christians that need to hear this. So if you're on your way to God, can I tell you something? If you're not religious, if you're new to this whole thing, it, it, it's not, we don't want to sell you on anything. It's Jesus is real. And I think sometimes us Christians are so, we don't want to try and be like that, one of those salespeople, that we don't tell you real things that are happening in our lives. And so I'm trying to help us. It's okay to use the J word. I'm going to tell you about a city in, uh, in the uh, Middle East. It's called Pergamum. Pergamum. I got to visit there. It's in, uh, in Turkey. It's in Turkey. It's gorgeous. There is this oversight of this. Uh, uh, there, there it is. I got, uh, on the one side is the sea. On the other side is the sea. It's on this little peninsula. And I got to sit in that amphitheater. See that amphitheater? It would hold thousands of people. Just so, and that big building in the back was a massive, massive library. <clears throat> there in Pergamon, it was known as the intellectual center of the whole area because they said parchment was in, invi invited, invented there. So they had one of the largest, uh, it was a university town, it was the largest university of the area, and it was a major center for Caesar worship. In fact, one, uh, once a year, all the citizens would have to come to the temple and just bow the knee and say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is my Lord. They just have to bow down and say, Caesar is my Lord at Caesar's temple. Uh, there, <clears throat> there was a proconsul there, which means basically he had the power of the sword. Now, there, there weren't too many of them around, but that just shows it's a political center. So if you're going to get killed by the Romans, you need to be taken to another city where the proconsul is. The proconsul lived there. So this is like, this is like high Roman, high, Pergamon, high, this is like intellectual cent center. And there was, let's call them a denomination, there was a group of Christians selling a book. No, I guess they didn't have books back then. Anyway, and, and they're called the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans. There were a few things wrong with them, but there was one thing the Nicolaitans talked about. They, the Nicolaitans would write about a thing called prudent compromise. Prudent compromise. That sounds wise. That sounds intellectual, doesn't it? It's a prudent compromise. And so they say, when you go to the temple once a year to go and bow the knee, just say the words. Don't believe them in your heart. Just say the words that Caesar is your Lord. What's the big deal? What are words anyway, right? It's not that big of a deal. Well, there were other Christians that disagreed. One was a man named Antipas. And he was captured by the Romans. And, uh, he, and he was sentenced, you know what for? Because he was healing people in Jesus' name. Bad man. <laughs> Healing people in Jesus' name, and he would not bow the knee to Caesar. He was martyred by thrown into a vat of boiling oil that was shaped in the, in the shape of a giant bull, which made it some kind of sacrifice to the foreign gods. Not probably a good way to go. That happened in 92. His name was Antipas. There was a quote that's attributed to him. Who knows if it was really to him or not? But this is what Antipas said. The person who is not interested in being different need not start on the Christian way. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? In other words, if you want to be normal, just the same as everyone else, Christian way is not for you. This is for something that gets in your soul and makes you a different person. In the book of Revelation, Jesus talks to this church. Jesus gives words of encouragement to every church that he talks to. And he gives words of rebuke to all except for one. And these are local gatherings. These are real churches. So this is for the followers of, of Jesus. And it's found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 13. I'm going to read verses 15 to 16 just to get to the pertinent points. And this is given to the church at Pergamum. He says this, Yet you remain true to my name. In other words, they would speak the name of Jesus. You did not renounce your faith in me. In other words, they didn't die, deny him when they were rounded up and brought to that theater to be killed. Not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. Now, awesome. Wouldn't you like to be mentioned in the Bible? That would be cool. All right. Yep, that was me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
thought that was me. You could talk about that in heaven all the time. <laughs> My faithful witness, who is put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Now, if you're not, if you're not like a, a believer, if you're not a follower of Jesus, that freaks you out a little bit, right? You know, it's the Satan thing. If you believe in good spirits, you should believe in evil spirits too, right? And there certainly is evil spirits out there. We know it. Some of us feel that. You know what? If that's the truth, then there is a evil spirit. And guess what? He's not God. He's not everywhere. Well, Satan did this. Satan, no, Satan didn't. No, his minions did. He, he's just one angel, right? He's an angel. That's it. And fallen angel. But he's only got one place. He lived in Pergamon for a while. That's bad. Don't let him into your community. Okay. So, who was put to death where Satan lives. And we're going to skip away. Likewise, you also have those who told to the tick teachings of the Nicolaitans. It's okay. We don't need to mention Jesus. How did Jesus feel about this? <laughs> don't read ahead. <laughs> repent, therefore. It's actually interesting. They're telling Christians to repent, isn't it? We still need to do that at times. Otherwise, I soon will come to you and fight against them with a sword of my mouth. Why the sword of his mouth? Because they're not saying anything with their mouth. And so Jesus says, I'm going to come and do some battle with my mouth. I'm going to say some things too. And you go, Dave, why would you read that? That's like a, that's a heavy thing. Well, I just want, I, I just kept on coming back to that. And I said, no, no, I need to go lighter because there's people on the way. And God kept on saying, no, Dave, you need to share this one. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 7 to 8 says this, For the Spirit of God does not make us timid. So when, when, when the Spirit of God stirs up your soul, and stir, and have you ever felt that? You know, you go, God help me, and all of a sudden, it's like he's helping you. It's just, and it's boldness that comes out, isn't it? So God did not give us a spirit of timidity uh, to make us timid, but gave us power and love. Isn't that good? It's not power and obnoxiousness. Praise the Lord. Amen to that. Amen. God did not say have power and be obnoxious. Have power and love. And self-discipline, which means you don't get to say everything you think. <laughs> Sometimes you have self-control. You go, okay, God, self-discipline. I need to have love. And he says this, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. What does testimony, that's such a Bible word. Testimony, it's God's story. Don't be ashamed of the God's story. You got God's stories? Don't be ashamed of, you. the God's story is Jesus' life. Don't be ashamed of the God's stories. Don't be ashamed of those. Huh. Rather, come on, join with me in suffering for the gospel. Come on in, the, the water's fine. <laughs> Jump in the pool, this is okay. Suffer for the gospel by the power of God. In other words, God will help you through these times. Jump in, the water is fine. I believe Jesus wants us to not be ashamed of his name. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Can I say, as your pastor, the guy that talks in front of you, it's different when I'm up here. Can I just say that? It's got to be brutally honest. And then when I'm out there, I got a new dentist. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to keep these pearly whites longer as long as I can. Yeah. And he does the dentist thing. Just before he puts the, you know, the, all the instruments in your mouth, he asks you questions. So you're going, ah, right? So he says, so what do you do? What do you do? Okay, I'm stuck, right? So I'm, you know, I'm going to say pastor. But you know what? There's a little voice in the back of my mind. You know what it says? It says, Dave, uh, like, like one, one month uh, out of the year uh, for like two courses, you get to be a professor. Tell him you're a professor because you're going to sound like really intellectual and there's no like, okay, I'm a professor. Really? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm that. I'm that. So I was going to say that. Like, God bless professors. Um, the idea is, but I was thinking, why am I doing that instead of doing the, the pastor word? Because, well, you know. You don't want to be seen as one of those Christians. So I said it. I'm a pastor. It goes, oh. <laughs> and in the middle of that, after causing me great pain, <laughs> and after deciding not to use certain words because I am a pastor, he said, tell me about your church. So I did. 
I did, and I told him about all the fun things we do, because there's good, fun things we do. Man, we are supporting one of the most impoverished area of the Dominican. This church is doing that. We are providing education for those kids. Isn't that awesome? Woo! I told him about that. I told him that we, we give gift baskets on, on, on Christmas to, to some of the surveys around our area. I told him we do, do back-to-school backpacks. And, and he was going, oh, good things, good things, good things. I had a little thing in the back of my mind. Tell him about changed lives. Ugh. I didn't want to, and I'm the pastor. <laughs> it's because that voice, right? That voice, I don't want to be obnoxious Christian. I don't want to be push my faith on people. And so I could choose to be silent. You know the fun, most fun thing about being a pastor at Church on the Rock? Seeing lives change when they meet Jesus. Changes them forever. Got it out. Got it out. And he didn't rip his clothes, run away, put he headphones on. He did not. I just told him something about that's real with me. That's it. Just real. Huh. Ask Jesus to help you figure out what's the diff where you need to land between obnoxious. Let's not be obnoxious. And silent. Let's not be silent. There's got to be something in between where we use the J word. This generation is leaving their faith thinking it's not functioning because we don't talk about real things we're all experiencing. We, we experience God. We do. But we don't talk about it because there's some voice in the back of our mind saying, don't talk because you're going to be obnoxious. <laughs> Use your words. As we influence, as we up our influence, is there a real thing happening in your life? Then you need to really share it. You need to give God the glory for that. <laughs> Especially when we're in people under our circle of care. When we're in people under a circle of care, we need to be able to talk about this. There are real answers to prayers. Some of you here have jobs because you prayed and God got you a fantastic job. We need to tell other people that God is amazing. There's been some really cool things happen. I remember the one, did you hear the, the story of the one young woman here going in for knee surgery? She went back to be prayed for, and God healed her knee to such a degree that surgeons said, well, I don't need to do surgery. <laughs> like, why, why are you here? And it's like, we need to be able to be okay talking about that and not thinking we're one of those, those Christians. It's ascribing God the glory. Huh. Let's just be real about what God is doing. Let's not be fake. Let's not be preachy. Don't make it up. Don't try and, 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 and sell people. Just tell people what is the real thing, especially those under your care, especially your kids. Parents, can you do that? If you haven't answered a prayer, if you read something in your Bible, could you do that for your kids' sake? There's a great verse in Psalm 29, verses 1 to 2. This one is one of these verses that has in my soul for a long time. It says this, it says this. Ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord, oh sons of the mighty. You do something well? Are you a son of, or daughter of the mighty? Ha <laughs> ha. Well, this is what he says. Ascribe to the Lord, oh sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Let's all say this together. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Do his name. You do something, do his name. Well, what does that mean? Parents, parents, do you ever get that sigh of overwhelming gratitude in God? Do you? Do you ever just say, oh, God, you're good. Well, use your words. Get, get, get it out and go, oh, I just, God is good. I love Jesus. That's all, it's just, use your words. 
when you get together with your small group or you get together with your mentees. And, and, and God has shown you some great things in the word and you've had a really cool devotion. I've been having a, I've been having a rocking time in the book of John. I've been finding out how, how uh, Pilate discovered that Jesus is like the son of God. He gets scared. And then the, the, the centurion at the end said, surely you are the son of God. And somehow that message got down. I'm, I'm loving this. As I'm getting into the word of God, and I'm with, I got to be able to say, oh, God just showed me this really cool thing. It's okay. If it's real, it's okay. You're on your way home from church <laughs> as you're driving along. Did God speak to you in this service? In the prayer corner by the communion table with a friend? In worship, did God speak to you? Then use your words. And you say, oh, wasn't Sunday t- Awesome. God showed me this. I'm not, don't make it up. But for us to influence this next generation, we need to be real about what God is doing. Can you just be real about that? Let's up our influence and let's use our words. I'll invite our worship team to come up on stage. I'm going to give you one story about a young man I had a chance to work with. It was one of those young men that, uh, that came and ran to my feet. When, uh, when, the, uh, <laughs> when things were, were going bad at a, at a retreat. His name was Jason. Uh, one of the things I used to do, I'd take a carload of these uh, 14-year-olds out, and we would go to McDonald's, serious things like that. And uh, what do you do with 14-year-old boys? I was 24. We went out in the woods and got broke branches off trees and hit each other with them. <laughs> serious discipleship. We were knights of the round table. We kept on bashing each other somebody, until somebody got hurt. They go, oh! <laughs> so good. I remember sitting on this grassy knoll, and we just sat there. And I go, and I, I got up, and I just shared the passion. I want to be a knight for Jesus. And all the guys said, go, oh, go, oh. I said, okay, can somebody knight me? Sir David, knight of the cross sticks. Anyway, I made it up on the spot. And so I knelt down, and these kids were, like, putting the branches on my shoulders. It was awesome. I said, you guys should make up knight names, too. One young man, Jason, who had abused by his dad, thrown downstairs, and his dad was eventually put in prison. He said, the 14-year-old, and he said this, he said, sometimes I feel the anger of my dad in me, and it scares me. And all, you know, whoa, whoa. He says, I don't want to be like him. Whoa, okay. And he says, but I want to turn that fire into fire for Jesus. And he knelt down, he said, knight me, Sir Jason, knight of the fiery heart. So we did. Jason still communicates with me, and he would be 48 years old now. (laughs) And he signs off, Jason, Sir Jason, knight of the fiery heart. Is there a way we can up our influence to see the people to be seen? And then just use our words. You'll be surprised what eternal fingerprint you can live, leave on people's lives. Heavenly Father, help us to know, know from you how and when to speak. And give us your boldness when we need to. In Jesus' name, amen.